Hey friends, how's it going? We're reading the last chapter in The Trumpet of the Swan today. I am so sad. I loved this book. It's always like ending, you know, a, uh, I don't know, like a friendship with this book. Oh, and it breaks my heart, but it's going to be a great ending. So let's read it. So this last chapter is called The Greening Spring. Lewis and Serena were more in love than ever. When spring came, they flew north, Lewis wearing his trumpet and his slate and his chalk pencil and his medal, Serena nothing. Now he was no longer, wait, now that he no longer had to work and earn, Lewis felt a great sense of relief. No more would he have to carry a money bag around his neck. The two swans flew high and fast, 10,000 feet above the earth. They arrived at last at the little pond in the wilderness where Lewis had been hatched. This was his dream, to return with his love to the place in Canada where he had first seen the light of day. He escorted Serena from one end of the pond to another and back again. He showed her the tiny island where his, mother had nest, where his mother's nest had been. He showed her the, long, that the log Sam Beaver had been sitting on when Lewis had pulled his shoelace because he couldn't say beep. Serena was enchanted. It was spring. The frog was waking from his long sleep. The turtle was coming to life again after his nap. The chipmunk felt warm. It felt the warm air, soft and kind, blowing through the trees, just as it did in that springtime when Lewis's father and mother had visited the pond to nest and to raise their young. The sun shone down strong and steady. Ice was melting. Patches of open water appeared on the pond. Lewis and Serena felt the changing world and they stirred with new life and rapture and hope. There was a smell in the air, a smell of the earth waking after its long winter. The trees were putting out tiny green buds, the buds were swelling. A better, easier time was at hand. A pair of mallard ducks flew in. A sparrow with a white throat arrived and sang, Oh, sweet Canada. Sweet, um, Serena chose a muskrat lodge on which to build her nest. It was right, it was the right height above the water. The muskrats had built it of muds and, mud and sticks. Lewis had hoped his wife might decide to make her nest in the same spot where his mother had built hers, but females are full of notions. They want their own way, pretty much, and Serena knew what she was doing. Lewis was so delighted when he saw her begin to construct the nest, he didn't really care where it was. He raised his horn to his mouth and played the beginning of an old song called It's Delightful to be Married. Then he helped by bringing a few pieces of coarse grass to her. Rain or shine, cold or warm, every day was a happy day for the two swans. In time, the eggs were laid and the cygnets were hatched, four of them. The first sound the baby swans heard was the pure, strong sound of their father's trumpet. Oh, ever in the green spring he played, by bank and bro retiring. There was, life was happy and busy and sweet in the little lonely pond in the north woods. Once in a while, Sam Beaver would show up for a visit, and they would have a great time together. Lewis never forgot his old jobs, his old friends, or his promise to the head man in charge of birds in Philadelphia. As the years went by, he and Serena returned each spring to the pond, nested, and had their young. And each year at the end of the summer, when um, the flight feathers grew back and the cygnets were ready to try their wings, Lewis took his family for the long tri trip across America. He led them first to Camp Kakuskus, where he had saved the life of Applegate Skinner and won his medal. The camp would be closed for the season, but Lewis liked to revisit it and wander around, remembering the boys and how he had earned his first hundred dollars as Camp Bugler. Then the swans would fly to Boston, where the swan boatmen always gave them a big welcome. Lewis would polish up his horn, blow the spit out of it, and swim in front of the boats again, playing row, row, row your boat and the people of Boston would hear the familiar sound of the trumpet of the swan and would flock to the public garden. Then the boatmen would treat Lewis and Serena to a night at the Ritz Hotel while the Signets spent the night by themselves on the lake, watched over by the boatmen. Serena dearly loved the Ritz. She ate dozens of watercress sandwiches and gazed at herself in the mirror and swam in the bathtub. And while Lewis stood and looked out the window at the public garden down below, Serena would walk around and around, turning lights on and off for the fun of it. Then they would both get into the bathtub and go to sleep. From Boston, Lewis would lead his family to the Philadelphia Zoo and show them Bird Lake. Here he would be greeted warmly by the head man in charge of birds. 
If the zoo needed a young trumpeter swan to add to its collection of waterfowl, Lewis would donate one of his signets, just as he promised. In later years, Philadelphia was also the place where they would see Sam Beaver. Sam took a job at the zoo just as soon as he was old enough to go to work. He and Lewis always had a great time together. Lewis would get out his slate and they would have a long talk like old times. After visiting Philadelphia, Lewis would fly south with his wife and children so they could see the great savannas where the alligators dozed in the swamp water and the turkey buzzards soared in the sky. And then they would return home to spend the winter in the Red Rock Lakes of Montana in the lovely, serene Centennial Valley where all the trumpeter swans felt safe and unafraid. The life of a swan must be a very pleasant and interesting life. And of course, Lewis's life was particularly pleasant because he was a musician. Lewis took good care of his trumpet. He kept it clean and spent hours polishing it with the tip of his wing feathers. As long as he lived, he felt grateful to his father, the brave Cobb who had risked his life in order to give him the trumpet he needed so badly. Every time Lewis looked at Serena, he remembered that the sound of the trumpet was what made her willing to become his wife. Swans often live to be very old. Year after year, Lewis and Serena returned in the spring to the same small pond in Canada to raise their family. The days were peaceful. Always, just at the edge of dark, when the young cygnets were getting sleepy, Lewis would raise his horn and play taps, just like he used to do at camp long ago. The notes were sad and beautiful as they floated across the still water and up into the night sky. One summer, when Sam Beaver was about 20, he and his father were sitting in the, their camp in Canada. After supper, Mr. Beaver was rocking in his chair, resting after a day of fishing. Sam was reading a book. Pop, said Sam, what is... Hmm. I'm trying to read this word. This is an interesting word. Crepus crepuscular mean. C-R-E-P-U-S-C-U-L-A-R. Crepuscular mean. How should I know, replied Mr. Beaver. I never heard that word before. It has to something to do with rabbit, said Sam. It says here that a rabbit is a <laughs> crepus... <laughs> I can't even say this word. Crepuscular animal. Probably means timid, said Mr. Beaver. Or maybe it means that it can run like the dickens. Or maybe it means it's stupid. A rabbit will sit right in the middle of the road at night and stare into your headlights and never get out of the way. And that's how a lot of rabbits get run over. Well, said Sam, I guess the only way to find out what crepuscular means is to look it up in the dictionary. We haven't got a dictionary here, said Mr. Beaver. You'll have to wait until we get back to the ranch. Just then, over the pond where the swans were, Lewis raised his horn and played taps to let his children know that the day had come to an end. The wind was right and the sound carried across the swamp. Mr. Beaver stopped rocking. That's funny, he said. I thought I heard the sound of a trumpet just then. I don't see how you could, replied Sam. We're alone in these woods. I know we are, said Mr. Beaver. Just the same, I thought I heard a trumpet or a bugle. Sam chuckled. He had never told his father about the swans in the pond nearby. He kept their secret to himself. When he went to the pond, he always went alone, and that's the way he liked it, and that's the way the swans liked it. What ever happened to your friend, Lew uh, Lewis? asked Mr. Beaver. Or, oh, let me say that again. What ever happened to your friend, Lewis? asked Mr. Beaver. Lewis was a trumpeter. You don't suppose he's somewhere around here, do you? He might be, said Sam. Have you heard from him recently? asked Mr. Beaver. No, replied Sam. He doesn't write anymore. He ran out of postage stamps, and he has no money to buy stamps with. Oh, said Mr. Beaver. Well, the whole business about that bird was quite cra was very crazy. I never did fully understand it. Sam looked across at his father and saw that his eyes were closed. Mr. Beaver was falling asleep. There was hardly a sound to disturb the stillness of the woods. Sam was tired and sleepy, too. He got out his notebook and sat down at the table by the light of the kerosene lamp. And this is what he wrote. Tonight I heard Lewis's horn. My father heard it too. The wind was right and I could t I could hear the notes of taps just as darkness fell. There is nothing in all the world I like better than the trumpet of the swan. What does crepuscular mean? Sam put his notebook away. He undressed and slid into bed. He lay there wondering what crepuscular meant. In less than three minutes he was fast asleep. On the pond where the swans were, Lewis put his trumpet away. The cygnets crept under their mother's wings. Darkness settled into the woods and fields and marsh. A loon called its wild night cry. As Lewis relaxed and prepared for sleep, all his thoughts were 
of how lucky he was to inhabit such a beautiful earth and how he had been and how lucky he had been to solve his problems with music and how pleasant it was to look forward to another night of sleep and another day tomorrow and the fresh morning and the light that returns with the day. The end. Oh, what a beautiful book. I am so glad I read that to you guys. I haven't read it in a really long time, so it was very, very positive and happy ending. So, all right. So tomorrow we'll start writing Freedom, and I'll read in the beginning. We're going to start from the beginning just because it's been so long since we read it. I know most of you were probably on Chapter 3. So I'm going to start from the beginning, and we'll get to hear them all. So I will see you all later. Bye.